Today, President Obama announced his plans to push for gun control through executive orders. President Obama will bypass Congress to widen background checks on buyers of firearms and a series of measures to address gun violence. Take a listen. I believe in the Second Amendment. It's there written on the paper. It guarantees a right to bear arms. No matter how many times people try to twist my words around, I talk constitutional law. I know a little bit about this. <laughs> I, I get it. But I also believe that we can find ways to reduce gun violence consistent with the Second Amendment. I mean, think about it. We all believe in the First Amendment, the guarantee of free speech, but we, ex we accept that you can't yell fire in a theater. We understand there are some constraints on our freedom in order to protect innocent people. Here with me now to offer his views on the president's plan and the 2016 campaign is Republican presidential candidate and former Pennsylvania Senator Rick Santorum. Thanks for being here, Thanks, sir. Thanks, Good to be here. So here. let me ask you right away your uh, reaction to the president. Well, I listened to the, the comments he made. I actually agree with. I mean, you know, really? every constitutional right has limitations on yeah. it. And there, and there, there are all sorts of limitations on the right to, uh, to own firearms in America. I mean, you can't own automatic weapons. You can't own suppressors, which are, you know, uh, silencers, uh, unless you have a federal license to do so. So there are all sorts of restrictions uh, that are in place to make sure that we're not uh, creating a, 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 an opportunity for another army to develop that could... That, but the, the idea of having the Second Amendment is really important to understand. It's not just for hunters. Uh, it's, it's for people to have the ability to protect themselves. And particularly if you look at the situation in San Bernardino, you look at the situation, let's, let's not take the terrorist incidents, let's just take some of these people who are mentally disturbed to go into a theater and start shooting people. Wouldn't you want to have the opportunity, if you're an American citizen, you know that this is happening, this happens. There are people who are mentally ill who, who get access to guns. There are terrorists who don't care whether they break a gun law and, and, and get weapons. And, and they're attacking soft targets, which are you know, newsrooms right. or, or theaters. Uh, wouldn't you want to have the ability to defend yourself? Wouldn't you have the ability to say, I've got my kids here, but the government's going to say, no, I'm, I'm going to make it really hard for you to be able to get a weapon so you as a law-abiding citizen can protect yourself in a world that is seemingly less and less safe. And, and that's really what the Second Amendment is for, but is for you to be able to protect yourself. But isn't the president sort of saying that, you know, that we, there are some loopholes that gun sellers have that should be fixed, that there are laws on the books, as you rightly claim, and that most Americans, all Americans would agree that they would like the ability to protect themselves. But being able to purchase an AR-15 is probably not what most people should be owning regardless of whether they're hunters or not. Well, I, I mean, you I'm, could... I, have, I, have, I own three R15, so but, I mean, but, I, the answer is I, mean, I, well, I don't consider myself a threat to society, no, right? No, of course, and most people, and you know, the majority of Americans are not, but I think what the president was asking specifically about was trying to close some of those loopholes and also asking Republicans in Congress to address the mental health issue, which a lot of Republicans have talked yeah, about. Yeah, the mental health issue is... I, I've just talked to a mental health professional in a school just before I came out here, and from San Diego, and uh, she's very concerned about what the president says. Puts her in a very difficult position. Uh, what are you going to say to, uh, to to the government? And you're giving the government these records, and the government can use these records not just for background checks, but they can use it for employment, they can use it for a lot of things. And so you're putting mental health professionals in a position of sharing that information. And now, what are you going to say to you or me or one, you know, or somebody we know who who goes to see a therapist, who goes to see a psychiatrist? Now you know that anything you say to that psychiatrist. Well, if you say it, it's going to be turned over to the government. How likely are you going to go to seek help? How likely are you going to go to talk to that mental health professional you may need to? So there are all sorts of complications and ramifications to what seems to be common sense so, uh, laws that a lot of mental health professionals are very concerned about. Are my patients going to tell the truth to me? Are they going to be able to come right. to me when they need that help? So it, I understand, look, I don't question the president's intentions. I really don't. I think the president really wants to try to reduce gun violence. I would say that uh, he's focusing in on the wrong side of the problem. And he's, he needs to focus in on when it comes to terrorism. He needs to focus in on the source of terrorism, which is defeating ISIS, which is actually constraining Iran from, from propagating terror. And on the issue of, of, of mental health issues and those who are 
uh, attacking uh, uh, their fellow Americans because of, of mental health problems. We need to go uh, and look at more fundamental issues of, you know, only uh, most of the mental health problems we're dealing with is addiction. And, you know, most addiction treatment programs have about a 15 percent success rate. Why should we be spending more money on something that has a 15 percent success rate? Shouldn't we be looking at how we can better improve our mental health treatment facilities and maybe focusing more resources on that instead of trying to chase around the end result uh, of, uh, of, of a failure of this other system. So listen, my producers are trying to get me to move on to Iowa, but before okay. we move on to that, but before we move on to that, sir, I want to ask you a question because you, you, you brought up an interesting point. What would President Santorum do to try and fix the incidences of gun violence in this country? Because as you said that the president should be focusing on terrorism, but some 3,380 Americans have been killed by terrorist acts since, 20, since 2001. 406,000 Americans have been killed through acts of gun violence in this country. So how do you fix that? Yeah, I would say there's uh, several things. First off, most of that gun violence uh, is unfortunately in our inner cities, and it's, uh, it's, it's a lot of it is crime-related, drug-related, uh, and, 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 and difficulties of the breakdown of the, of, of the community and of the family. So, I, look, at, at the heart of the problem of this country is the breakdown of the nuclear family, particularly in our poor communities. And if we don't begin to, to establish and reestablish fathers taking responsibility for their children and rebuilding the nuclear family in this country, where, where particularly young men have role models and, and, and the opportunity to have the kind of support that they need from a father figure in their life, then gun violence is, is going to continue. You got it goes back to whether it's terrorism and going after ISIS or, or the issue of gun violence in, 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 uh, in our poor communities in America and going after the root cause of the breakdown of the family. Those are where I would spend my time and energy. All right, let's talk about Iowa. We are just weeks away from the Iowa caucus, and your campaign is out with its very first ad. Let's take a look. Ted Cruz is wonderful at reading children's fairy tales on the Senate floor. Sam, I am. Rick Santorum spent his time in the Senate a little differently. Eight years on the Senate Armed Services Committee, helping to modernize today's army to better be prepared for today's threats. Santorum also wrote and passed tough laws, putting harsh sanctions on Iran. And for more than a decade, Rick Santorum has been a leader taking on radical Islam. Not all Muslims are jihadists, and no one would say that. But the reality is, all jihadists are Muslims. You want someone to read one hell of a bedtime story? Ted Cruz is your guy. If you want to protect America and defeat ISIS, Rick Santorum's your president. So you won Iowa back in 2012, but Senator Cruz is now leading in the polls in Iowa. Why are evangelicals seemingly attracted to him? Uh, I think a lot of folks are just really frustrated and they're looking for someone who's, uh, who's been out there fighting. Uh, and I think what this ad really points to is it's great to fight. Anybody can fight. But the question is, can you effectively fight and win? And can you actually move the ball forward and, and accomplish things that this country really needs? And that's really the, what this ad was really about. It's great if you have someone who, uh, who, you know, I'm a fighter. Look at the record. Look at the record of someone who's accomplished things, who's actually done the things that are necessary to keep our country safe, as opposed to someone who, you know, stands up in filibusters but loses and, and has, has no record of accomplishment in a very short period of time and very little experience in, in it and, and hasn't, really, uh, hasn't really shown that they can do what's necessary to bring people together to make something happen. And, and I think in the end, what, what I'm, uh, I believe that Iowans will do, and I think Republicans generally will do, is they'll, they'll look for someone who both can fight and can accomplish something, and that's what we bring to the table. You are the only Republican candidate to have visited all 99 counties yes. in Iowa. You won it back in 2012. Mike Huckabee won it in 2008. Yeah. But, but it, it, is it as important as perhaps in our democratic system we make it out to be? Because you guys, you win it, but then you don't go on to win the GOP nomination. Well, I would, I would argue that Iowans probably uh, do a better job of getting it right. The last time uh, the Republican nominee won, uh, that was George W. Bush, and actually he won Iowa and lost New Hampshire. Right. Uh, the people who, uh, four years later was, uh, eight years later was Huckabee, and four years after that was me, and we both won Iowa, and the other candidate uh, who actually became the winner won New Hampshire, and they went on to lose the election. Right. So I would make the argument that maybe people should start listening to Iowa. They do a better job, in my opinion, 
of getting to know the candidates. The candidate spends a lot more time there. There's uh, the, the folks who vote in caucuses, I think over a third of them, according to the exit polls, actually met the candidates, talked to the candidates. They do a pretty good job of, uh, of, of interviewing and, and ferreting out who the right candidate is, and, and that's why I'm putting my faith there again this time. Let's talk about the overall GOP frontrunner, but he's not leading in Iowa. Donald Trump, this morning, Carly Fiorina went after Mr. Trump, and she compared him to another, have you seen this? She no. compared him to another famous reality TV star. Take a look. Okay. There is no doubt right. Donald Trump is an extremely divisive candidate. That's why he cannot win. That is why he cannot be our nominee. But honestly, Donald Trump reminds me of the Kim Kardashian of politics. They're both famous for being famous, and the media plays along. Thoughts? Well, I mean, you know, Donald Trump's famous uh, because Donald Trump's an entrepreneur and has made a lot of money and has a reality TV show. And so in that, that respect, there's a little difference in the Kardashians. I mean, he's not as not as attractive as the <laughs> Kardashians. And I, and I think Donald would probably admit to that. But uh, but he certainly has accomplished a lot in his life and business. And so I don't think it's fair to say that that uh, he's famous because he's famous. He's famous because he's he's accomplished a lot and uh, in the business world. And, and uh, he became famous because of that. So uh, whether that ties into being a real estate developer in New York uh, and in Las Vegas and, or, or Atlantic City ties into whether you can be an effective president, uh, I think that's an issue that, uh, that is very much open. Uh, I, I don't believe that those necessarily, in fact, given what I know about what it takes to be president, the president is not the CEO of the con country. The president is someone who has to be able to work with people, be able to uh, work with members of Congress, we're, and, and, and communicate to the American public and provide a vision and provide leadership. You can't, even as much as President Obama has tried to use executive orders to just do everything without the Congress, you can't effectively govern this, con uh, this country without getting the American people and the Congress to go along with you. And that's not what a CEO has to do. A CEO can make decisions and then uh, take the consequence. That's not how it works in Washington. When you see, though, the rise of Donald Trump and his uh, candidacy, are you seeing a retooling of the Republican Party? I mean, if, if Mr. Trump is the eventual GOP nominee, and I know that you think it's going to be you, but if he should be that GOP nominee, A, would you support him? And B, would we be seeing what I've been talking about, which is sort of a Goldwater moment back in 1964 when Barry Goldwater ran for the presidency, and then the Republican Party completely retooled itself? Would you see the same thing here? Um, I think the Republican Party is going through a, a, a change without, without a question. I think there's, if you look at the Republican Party, you know, 20 years ago, it was a suburban party. It was a country club Republican Party. Uh, there were certainly conservative elements in, in, in rural areas. But now it's, it's much more of a blue collar party. It's much more of a, of a working party, small business party. It's not the, the corporate elites. It's not the, uh, the Wall Street. It's not, that's not, that's where the, that money goes to the Democratic Party now. Uh, as much as they rail against the, uh, the elite, they, that's, who, that's who they are and that's who supports them. And so I think Trump is, has, has tuned, tuned into that. That's, what, that's how I won Pennsylvania. I mean, I won Pennsylvania not because I won the wealthy suburbs of Philadelphia. It's because I won the blue-collar areas up in the Northeast in Scranton and in Pittsburgh and the suburbs. That's, that's why I think Trump is resonating because that's where the Republican Party has moved. And I think one of the reasons we were successful four years ago and one of the reasons we'll be successful this time. Would you support candidate Trump if he's the I'll GP support, nominee? like, I'm going to support any, any Republican nominee versus either Hillary Clinton or Bernie Sanders. That's an easy call. Do you think uh, a President Trump is, is somebody you could get behind over a President Clinton? Uh, well, yeah, no question about it. Look, I, do, do I have concerns about Donald Trump? Yeah, I do. I wouldn't be running if I was really comfortable with any of the other Republican candidates that they could do the job that, that I felt I can do. But uh, if you look at the, the principles that he's articulating in this race, uh, if he sticks to those principles uh, in the general election, uh, those principles I can be supportive of over what, what Hillary Clinton has articulated. All right, let me ask you, as two former altar boys, uh, you know, Good. you're in Butler, Pennsylvania, yeah. me in Queens, New York. Uh, right. I finally got out of the business when my mother let me get out in high school. But, but how does your faith play a role in how you govern? And I, and I specifically ask that uh, because you've come out um, against, well, not against, but you've, you've criticized the Pope because you said that he should leave science to the scientists when it comes to climate change, which the Catholic Church feels is a more moral issue, um, but clearly on the issue of abortion, you and the church are in line. Uh, are you, and this is a term I just heard recently as we saw the pontiff come to the United States, are you, do you consider yourself a cafeteria Catholic? Oh, no, no, Where you no. sort of pick and choose what... No, no, look, I, what, I, I, listening to Pope Francis and the way he's talked about the issue of the environment, I think is a very compelling uh, narrative. Look, we have a responsibility uh, as, as God's creatures to take, to be good stewards of the earth. Do I agree with him on every element of, of how he believes we need to do that? No, but 
uh, I do believe that he's put, brought up a very important issue, and he's used that issue, I think, very effectively to reach out to Pope, people who may not agree with the Pope or the Catholic Church on a variety of other issues, and, and tried to paint a, a picture saying, look, if you believe it's our responsibility to take care of nature and take care of this earth, well, then, you know, look at... Uh, the, the extension of that, then we need to be take care of all of God's creatures, and that includes, by the way, the baby in the womb, and that and that baby needs a nurturing mother and father, their natural mother and father. So he's sort of weaving a narrative, starting at the beginning, if you will, and weaving it and trying to bring people in. So saying, you know, you can't just stop, stop here, and by the way, uh, those on the right, you can't just start here. Uh, you have to look at it as a complete fabric, and I, I think that's a very effective way of, of laying out uh, that uh, that theology or philosophy. But the pontiff believes climate change is caused by man. Do you disagree? Uh, I don't believe that. I don't believe that man is the central reason for the climate to change. I think there are hundreds of factors that cause the climate. Look at what's going on uh, here in, in, in just this year with El Nino. I mean, El Nino has caused dramatic changes in climate, uh, which... Uh, I don't know if this is affected at all by, by CO2. So the idea that, that, uh, that the science is settled on this, here's what, when I hear someone say the science is settled, uh, I know it's not science because no scientist ever says the science is settled because there's always scientific discoveries that say, you know, something we firmly believed was true. And we found out, oh, wow, we have new evidence that says, well, that may not be quite true, particularly in the area of, of something like, uh, like climatology, which is, uh, which is a very new science out there. So, no, I, I don't like the idea that, that anytime I hear climate, that a scientist say that, I know they're more political science than they are real sciences. And I think there is always room for dissent within the scientific realm, and, and I, uh, it's an important, uh, important missing element of this debate. Senator, before we let you go, i got to ask you a fun question. What's your favorite movie, and can you quote a line from that movie? Um, well, I, I have a lot of favorite movies. <laughs> uh, yeah, Field of Dreams is, is one of my favorite. Just, just, I love baseball. I'm a huge baseball fan. Uh, so that's a great famous uh, a favorite of mine. And uh, another one is uh, I'm, I'm a big Godfather. I love, who doesn't love, I, I the, love Godfather. the Godfather? And, and, uh, you don't want to be like that senator there who shows up in Michael's office. No, no, right? no, no. no. And, and uh, my, I, I bought my kids when I was in Cleveland, Little Italy. There's a, there's a bakery uh, called uh, Corbo's Bakery. And they have uh, they have T-shirts with a line from The Godfather. Now you've you've seen The Godfather. Sure, right? sure. Okay. What, what, li what line is at the on the back of their T-shirt? Leave the gun, take the cannoli. That's exactly right. That's exactly. Congratulations, you win. So, Senator Rick Santorum, thank, thank you very much. You Thanks bet. for coming by. Good luck thank to you, you. sir.